morning. <clears throat> For those of you who don't know, pastor is at a retreat. Um, I never thought our pastor would retreat, but he's retreating today. <laughs> I'm not sure what that is, but uh, maybe Joe will explain it to us a little bit later. Joe and Cindy had uh, some input on that, something to do with it. But uh, what a beautiful day. What a beautiful day. Things are happening. Just as a side note, did you see that um, Congress voted and our president went against the vote of Congress and on Friday released $192 million to the Palestinians? <clears throat> Excuse me? Yeah, there's actually sanctions that we uh, had in effect. Congress... Uh, said because of the conflict that's going on there and the fact that they weren't doing what they're supposed to do. We were withholding money. We were holding a lot of different things. So Congress says, no, we're going to keep that in, 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 uh, in effect. And our president on Friday, when all the newscasters go home for the weekend, made a move and says, no, we're actually going to give them the $196 million. So your $196 million of taxpayer money just went to the Palestinians. Prepare for judgment. When we make moves like that against Israel, God moves. Yeah. We've seen it in the past many, many times. It's not a coincidence. When we do something against Israel, there's judgment that comes upon our nation. Pretty amazing, right? Yes. So the people vote. The Congress votes one way. But yet, God says, no, I want you to give them money. Remember, it's God who be, God's orchestrating this. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't sit well for us. We know judgment's coming. But God turns the heart of the king and says, here's what I want you to do. So, hang on. Hang on. Praise God. Let us open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and for the full knowledge and understanding that you are in control of all things. So, Father, when things don't make sense in this natural world... Let us understand that you have preordained these things before time. Let us come to the full knowledge and the peace knowing that you are orchestrating these moves. And as we go forth today, Father, we ask that more revelation come about your kingdom, how your process works, how we are to enter in, and what you want us to do in this kingdom. Father, we thank you for what you're about to do, and we pray in the majestic name of Jesus. Amen. just said what's going to happen to us next I think it's important that if we start to look at who we are in Christ and the kingdom principles that we're about to go through today that maybe that question could be put a little differently and say what's going to happen to them next instead of us next in other words we're going to see that there's an actual separation of the child of God from this system that if we continue to look towards this system for our sustenance, for our security, for our prosperity, God is going to work in, in His children and say, listen, that's not where I told you to look for your safety, for your security. Stop looking to that system. That system is failing. And it's ordained to fail. God is directing it to fail. And we are strangers, we are aliens, we are ambassadors from another country, the country of heaven, if you will. And he said, while you are there in that country, I want you to affect it and show them what the kingdom of heaven looks like. That's what Jesus did. Jesus did not get upset with the economy of the Roman government. He did not get upset when he was taxed and didn't have a whole whole lot of money to pay the tax. What did he do? 
Yeah. Yeah, he says, I, I don't worry about these things because my Father will supply all my needs according to His riches and glory. And that's the way we should be. God, I know it doesn't make sense and you know that the pot's a little low on, on change. But God, I'm trusting you. And who knows how God's going to bring resources to us, but that's none of our business. Our business is to seek His kingdom and His righteousness. And He said, all these things will be added to you. So I think that question is very timely. I think the things that are happening are very timely. And God laid it upon my heart to touch upon the kingdom of God versus religion. And I submit to you that religion is actually a spirit. The spirit of religion is very strong. It has a very (coughs) dynamic grasp on a lot of people that are trying to seek God. I don't know all of your backgrounds, but my background was one of, I didn't have a stronghold of religion. In fact, it was the last thing I wanted. I wanted a relationship with this God. He was calling me. He was pressing me. He was putting me in a position where I knew he was there all along, but I tried to keep him at arm's length and do my own thing. And then when I got in trouble, I'd call on God or I'd say, Oh, beautiful day, God. Thank you very much. And went about my own kingdom. But when religion pops its head up, God has given me the ability to see it. And it has given me a distaste for it. And the more I read the scriptures, the more I see religion being rejected by Jesus. He says, no, no, you, you do things that are of man, that you're laying things on man, and you're actually keeping the kingdom of God at bay. And we're going to see that this morning. So I want to open with a statement. As Christians living in America, the kingdom system and its concepts often do not register in our brains, and therefore it becomes difficult to understand the message of the Bible. The secret to a full and fulfilled life is discovery, understanding, and application of the kingdom of heaven on earth. God's desire for you is that you enter the kingdom lifestyle now and experience, explore, apply, practice, and enjoy living with those benefits, the promises and the privileges of heaven on earth promised by God. When you surrender to God, you repent, and God says you are born again of a new seed. We are to look towards God's system of governing at that point. Up until that point where we are actually transformed by His light, by His word, we are actually living in a system of sin and curse. Do you understand that? Every system, every government in the world up to date has been a downward spiral. Can anybody understand that? You see all of the different types of government in the world, socialism, communism, dictatorship, democracy, they're all in a point of unwinding. They never really last forever, do they? Why is that? They're a man. man. But can't man just figure out something that even through trial and error is going to work? They don't have God. But yet man is governing man, so shouldn't man be able to govern man on some level and and, and run a system that's actually going to be beneficial to all? No, there's too much selfishness. Too much selfishness. Exactly. Man looks looks to man for his resources, and ultimately greed kicks in and all of the fleshly desires and the flesh nature takes over, and then you have a system that's unwinding very rapidly. But very simply stated, the Bible. This Bible is about a king and a kingdom and a royal family of children. That's what it's about. In its simplistic nature, it's about a king and about a kingdom and about his children, his royal children. That's you and me. 
Do you understand we were not His children when we were born? That is by His mercy and His grace He pulled us out. And especially the church age, he said, I am actually adopting you. I'm grafting you in where you never belonged. We did not have it in us, nor do we have it in us to seek God. But yet, while we were unrighteous and while we were sinners, God reached out and grabbed us and pulled us out of our highway to hell and put us on the highway to heaven. If you turn your Bibles to Genesis 1, to show you a few things this morning. And it may give clarity <clears throat> to how we are to live out this, this Christian life. In Genesis 1, verse 26, <clears throat> God says, Let us <clears throat> make man in our image after our likeness. And let them, God's talking about man, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. What's the first thing we see God doing to his children? As he's he's creating man in the likeness of God, The first thing he's doing is giving us what? Dominion. Dominion. Do we know what the word dominion means? Dominion comes from domain. It's a king's right to rule, basically. It's the right to have rulership and authority over a particular territory. So he's giving us dominion not only over the territory, but the things in that territory. So when man fell from grace, he did not lose a religion. He actually lost a dominion. So when Adam and Eve were anointed by God, covered in his glory, given a mandate, given dominion, and they disobeyed God, They didn't lose a religion. It's important to understand. There was no religion about it. It was a relationship between God and man. And very specifically, God says, I give you a lot of authority, a lot of uh, dominion, but there's one thing I just, you just can't do that. Well, the nature of man was such that they made that mistake. So when there was a separation... So we're going to see, basically, there was a separation between man and God at that point. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. This is a legal document. There was a separation, and at that point, man lost his dominion. The Bible is not primarily about a religion or rituals but about the establishment of a kingdom rulership on this planet from the heavenly realm. It is about a divine project of governing the earth from heaven through mankind. So in practical terms, the Bible is about a royal family that started with Adam, mandated to colonize earth from heaven. Now if that's a little fuzzy, hang on because we're going to clear that up. But let me read that again. In practical terms, the Bible is about a royal family mandated, given dominion, to colonize earth from heaven. From the heavenly realm. Not my will, Lord, but your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. God's will is to replicate the heavenly realm the invisible realm of heaven, that realm, here in the physical realm. Watch this. This is absolutely amazing. What did Jesus have to say about religion and the kingdom? Let's just start with our master, the king. His first public statement is in Matthew 4, verse 17. Jesus had been anointed by the Holy Spirit. He'd been led to the 
wilderness. He'd been tempted for 40 days. And he comes upon the scene. And what's the first thing he says? Let's start a religion. Let's get together and have church and praise and we're going we're gonna to do all sorts of great things. We're just going to praise God together. We're go- What's the first thing that he says as he announces his entrance? He says, behold, excuse me, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent. That's the first thing he says. Isn't that amazing? The first thing that we see Jesus saying as he walks on the scene is, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What Adam lost in rebellion to God, which is truly what it was, What Adam lost was the kingdom domain. The dominion that he was given by God to have rulership over this planet to bring heaven to earth. That relationship, that dominion, that authority was lost. Jesus comes back and says, it's back. In me, it's back. Behold, repent, turn around, don't do what you used to do, submit, repent, the kingdom is back, the kingdom is at hand. You don't see that anywhere else, from the time Adam lost it to the time Jesus came back, throughout the whole Old Testament, you don't see anybody saying the kingdom is at hand, do you? Is Jesus not the second Adam? Are we not told that? What the first Adam lost, the second Adam got it back. Watch this. The power of religion lies in its ability to serve as a substitute for the kingdom and thus will actually hinder mankind from pursuing the genuine answer to his dilemma. We are born... Dominion creatures. That's what God spoke to us and over us. So that's kind of in our spiritual DNA. For instance, don't we all like to have our own stuff? Even if you're married, you got your own stuff. This, this is my stuff and that's your stuff. And I know we're married and this, this is really, but this is my stuff. And you can do that with ice cream, right? <laughs> Anybody? Amen? (laughs) Don't be touching my ice cream. You go get your own. So we we are possessive type creatures. And we want to be able to rule our own kingdom. We want to set it up just so. Some of us like to set the cans in our shelves alphabetically so our own little kingdom is all in order. Some of us don't care about the the one closet with all the clutter in it. That's the backside of the kingdom. But we are we are dominion built. That's how we're wired. So that we have control over our little own little kingdom, correct? Can we identify with that? Am I the only one? I like to have everything in order. When things get out of order, we get a little upset, don't we? Well, we are wired that way. But we lost that dominion. So we've been seeking how to get that dominion back. And religion says... Well, you do it through rules and regulations because you've got to align yourself with God. That's our true calling to get back in touch with God. So the power of religion lies in its ability to serve as a substitute to the kingdom. It's man's way of getting to God, not God's way of getting to man. Secondly, religion preoccupies man until he finds the kingdom. If any of you have been heaped in religion and brought up in a religious background, when you find out about the kingdom, you are absolutely going to explode in freedom and enjoy and understanding how this whole system of God works, how this government of God works. Religion is what man does until he finds the kingdom, and religion prepares man. Get this. Religion prepares man, gets us all ready in a nice little neat package, If you do this, and you do this, and you do this, and you do this, God will accept you. Religion prepares you to leave earth and go to heaven, correct? 
Isn't that what it does? It puts you in a nice little Christian suit. But the kingdom actually empowers man to dominate earth. So religion says you're here and here's how you've got to get spiritually. Here's how you've got to get emotionally. Here's all the things you must do in order to get to God. And God says, wait a minute, I'm ready to pour out to you so that you can again have dominion here. Quit looking to heaven. Heaven's looking to you. Do you see that? Religion is restriction. Religion will actually put you in a straitjacket spiritually. God says, that's not how we're going to do this. I'm going to actually empower you and give you dominion back so that you can be the conduit, if you will, of heaven on earth. Religion focuses on heaven and the kingdom focuses on earth. Religion is reaching up to God. The kingdom, of, the kingdom is God reaching down to man. You see the opposite? Go ahead. So how do we fit in that? Because, and I don't know if it's the Bible or if it's religion, but I mean... It seems like all through your through your life of studying the Bible, you go through that sanctification process because when you die, you go to heaven. Mm-hmm. Right? How much sanctification in that process did the thief on the cross go through next to Jesus? So is that a requirement to entering the gates of heaven? Sanctification? The process, the refining. What did he do? He repented. He repented, didn't he? He was a thief on the cross. Didn't say he was innocent on the cross. Jesus was innocent. He was a thief on the cross. He repented. He says, hey, we own this one, dude. But he didn't do anything. Will you remember me in your kingdom? Remember that? He repented. He knew exactly who he was. And Jesus looked at him and says, hey, today you're going to be with me in paradise, dude. You figured it out. You got it. Exactly. Exactly. And that, the, the belief of Jesus on who he was, actually came from the Father. It comes from God himself. But very simplistic. He acknowledged Christ submitted to his lordship, called him Lord, and he also repented. He knew who he was and knew that he was, he was, he was on that cross because he had sinned. But Jesus was not on that cross. It was on that cross because he had not sinned. In other words, he knew that who he was and here is Jesus dying on the cross. So, there was no sanctification. It was just immediate. Where you and I and us, as we come to Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells in us and all of, all of a sudden starts to convict us. See, the thief on the cross had no future where the Holy Spirit was going to convict him of, of making the wrong moves against God. You and I, on a daily walk, we'll go to say something and the Spirit will go, no, don't say that. Or, too late, you shouldn't have said that. Or, you shouldn't have done that. Amen? That sanctification process makes us over time more Christ-like, more holy if we submit and yield to it. But religion comes at it from a different angle. And religion says, here's what you must do. And it's a deeds mentality. It's a works mentality. It's actually bondage. And it's keeping us from the freedom of the kingdom of heaven and the dominion that we're supposed to walk in. So, Jesus says, um, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless it comes through me. Right? Correct. You know, I still think that the focus for many people, myself included, is where, you know, when my time comes, I want to make absolutely 100% sure that I know where I'm going. Mm-hmm. 
You know, and there's always that doubt that comes in, and I know where that doubt comes from. But, so how do you change that focus? I don't even, I don't even know if I can explain this properly, but you, you really do. You, you should be thinking about, okay, what does God want me to do here? The kingdom of God is not in heaven. The kingdom of God is here on earth. And it doesn't matter when he takes us. We're living... We're living here and now for him. Correct? Exactly. So what is your question? <laughs> I guess I'm trying to reason it out. I'm sorry. That's okay. In other words, does anybody in here, other than Linda, at times question your salvation? Oh, yeah. You keep thinking of my good God. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And part of that is working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Because we're going to stand before a holy God one day. You know he's going to ask us questions and we're going to see ourselves. But for the righteous, the righteous, that means right standing with God. You sin not. Jesus took that sin. All your past sins and all the future ones. As we're seeking God, we're going to make mistakes. As we're being sanctified, we're going to make mistakes. And as we are led astray, as sometimes we are, by the enemy, by our flesh, he gets us out there, and then once we're out there, the Holy Spirit convicts us, and the enemy jumps in and says, Ha ha, so you're some Christian, aren't you? He convicts, he tries to condemn you for what he's led you into. Amen? Once he gets you out there, he goes, Oh, look where you're at. Go ahead. It's like religion says you got to offer up these prayers a hundred times to God. And that's where the difference is. Is that as believers, we're supposed to wait upon the Holy Spirit to tell us what what we should do next. Uh, as opposed to religion saying we need to offer up these prayers a hundred times to God. Uh, and that's... Exactly. That's the work. That's the work religion. You have to do this you know, to get to please God. When the Holy Spirit is saying to you, maybe at this moment, pray for someone, do this, and you're responding to, to God, not to man-made saying you have to do it. Right. Absolutely. And oftentimes, God will ask you to do something when it's not really convenient for you to do it. Amen? I was just going to say, it's when you believe in Christ, truly believe in Christ, that you're holy not trying to be holy to get to that point. You follow what I'm trying to say? Mm-hmm. When you believe in Christ, you become holy automatically. When you're trying to be holy to get to Christ, that's religion. You're right. We don't have any holiness, though, do we? Actually, let me, let me just correct you on that. When we come to Christ, we are declared righteous. It's actually a legal standing. And you're going to see in the book of Revelation that there's actually two different um, areas of righteousness. One is being declared righteous and the other is actually being declared holy. For the lost, there is also unrighteousness and filthiness. The holiness is a process that we, through yielding, through sanctification, we become more and more and more like Christ himself. Or... We can hold the spirit at bay and grieve him and say, no, I'm, I'm righteous, but I'm still going to do what I want to do on some level. And your holiness is held at bay. So that is a process, actually, that we continue to walk towards at different levels of holiness. That's a deep theology. There's a whole lot of things in there. But, but we are truly declared righteous. And that, in fact, Scripture tells us that we are declared Perfect, just like Jesus, because God is looking at us through the blood of Christ. Exactly. Well, that's what I thought. If you come to Christ, if you come to Christ for Christ to take your sins away, and then you, you, you become holy because you can't have no sin. You may have sin, but He's overlooking you, pushing it aside. So He's looking at you mm-hmm. like you're holy, even though you you still have all them sins here. He's going right through them. Exactly. Exactly. You know, um, I, uh, uh, only girls. 
I was raised in church, I was baptized at 12 years old, so I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know the preacher was drowning. But <laughs> then when I got older and I went to the church, junior church, kids' church, then run up to young adults' church, I married my husband and we went to church. I never realized the voice that's in me was telling me when I was doing something wrong that it was the Holy Spirit. I was the first thing that ever happened to me. I was in the middle of a, a lake and I saw the wall of my little rubber thing that I had out there and I was going to ground. But I heard this voice very distinctly saying, Virginia, and I think it was in Virginia. Have push your feet up down, move your hands around, and we'll get you back to shore. And I thought to myself, first of all, I thought it was my husband. Sounds like you came in. And uh, then later on in life, um, the same voice comes to me one day. It's, I was about to commit murder. I had, in my car, Angel the City, I had a very foul mouth. And I floored, I lost it. I floored I've come so close to him that he was trapped up against the bus. And this voice very strongly said to me, Virginia, put your brakes on. I lived with this kid. And then later on, I found out that he's correcting me. I always thought to myself, why don't you keep me around? You must have something for me to do. And then here lately, within last year, when I lost my timber and said a few choice words I shouldn't have said. And I went into my little apartment and I no more to sit down in my chair and a very strong he said and then so he said, Okay young lady, you have had your fit. Now you go back and you show them that you are a Christian. You go apologize to those things. That was the hardest thing I had to do that but I get up and go in there and say, I'm sorry I did not mean to lose my temper, and God sent me back, and so I'm here. Now, wait a minute. You didn't have to do, go do a religious exercise of some sort? <clears throat> no. You didn't have to do, do A, B, C, D in order to get right back in standing with God? No. You mean it was just as simple as obeying his, his voice? So the question is, how do we become children of God? If we are in his kingdom and we are his children, how do we truly walk in this kingdomship? How do we walk as sons and daughters... In the kingdom. Romans 8, Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. This holiness, um, when, uh, you know, uh, it's a be holy as I am holy. I don't know how to be holy, but doesn't God, uh, God see Christ's holiness over me, not any holiness that I have? Mm-hmm. Is that right? He sees God, he sees the right he sees you as righteous, a legal standing in a legal book. You have fulfilled the obligations to be declared legally righteous. Now, let's walk this sanctification process out. Let's walk this. By my Holy Spirit, I will empower you to bring the kingdom of God to this earth. And in that process, you are going to become more like Christ. If you hold me at bay, you will suffer the consequences in the future. On the other side, when we're out of here someday, at the beam of seat of Christ, we are going to receive rewards. We are going to receive privileges. We are going to rule and reign as kings, correct? I submit to you that some of us will not rule and reign. But we will enter the kingdom. It's a whole other study. This is a little funny, but as, when the uh, owner talks about uh, some of the things that happened there, I think this is a bit here. God's up there and he's got his hands on me. He's down and he says, Here. He says, You know something? I love that woman. He said, She's always seeking me, she's always searching for me. And she's doubting, but she's got it. We got it. We're going to let her go. That's all it is. But you need to send to the palm of your hand. You need to go into the You're too precious. I feel totally saved. Oh, yeah. 
<clears throat> Not at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 23, please. Let's see what Jesus had to say about religion. There are some religions that don't even want you to read the Bible. Why could that possibly be? <clears throat> Maybe you'll misinterpret. Matthew 23, verses 13 and 15. Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you shut up the what? The kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Jesus says, Woe unto you, you religious folks. There's other adjectives I could use. Woe unto you, you religious rulers, because you are actually stopping the children of God from entering into the kingdom because you can't even get in there yourself. Because you're doing it through religion and religion will never get to the kingdom of God. He says in verse 15, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! Don't we love people calling us hypocrites? For you compass the sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you made him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Jesus was not politically correct. He's, here's this young rabbi, they say wet behind the ears, going up against the religious powerhouse of that day, saying, listen, you guys are going to hell and you're making these children, these who are trying to seek the kingdom, twice the children of hell as you are. You're actually shutting them out of the kingdom by your religious deeds and acts and you aren't even there yourself. Oh, you better not read that. That, that couldn't really mean that. Matthew 15, verse 6. Jesus says again, Matthew 15. The second part of that, he says, You have made the commandment of God of none effect by your traditions. The traditions of religion, the tradition of the typical church, you're actually nullifying the word of God. You're keeping them out of the kingdom. You basically created your own kingdom, call it by whatever name you want, by whatever denomination you want, and you're actually holding them back from entering into the kingdom because you yourselves aren't even in it. Matthew 21. I love Jesus. Amen. Matthew 21, verse 31. Jesus says in the second part of verse 31, Verily, or truly I say unto you, that the publicans, or the tax collectors, and the harlots, the prostitutes, will go into the kingdom of God before you. Think about what he just said. Can you, can you see them dressed in their religious garb? These are the ones that go out and pray in public their long prayers. These are the ones that do their alms in front of everybody so that it can be seen. These are the ones that pray these long, repetitious prayers. They've got the gowns and they've got the, the headdresses. They've got their wraps. And Jesus says to them, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going to get in before you guys. I don't think Jesus was really big on religion. Now, if that's his position on religion, where does that come from? 
where does where he's speaking against that? Where can that only come from? Because people who are not with God are using religion to try to feel like they 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 know they're not. So they're using that religion. They're doing all the signs for people to see everything that goes along with it to make it look like they're. Saint with Jesus. Can you give me an example? Well, if I'm if I'm if, if, if I'm looking at you and you were looking at me and you're thinking that I'm not a saved person, I'm going to do all the things that I'm supposed to do to show you I'm saved. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have to show you, and that makes me feel close to God. But I'm not truly, because I'm not that true believer. And I'm going to tell you what it takes to be saved. Are you asking where did religion come from? Mm -hmm. How did it get? How did it get into the church? Where does that come from? Satan, you know, definitely is is the answer there. But it's it's man's pride after you get into some position that starts taking over because it's all about you and not about the faith that you're actually. Showing it, you know, to judge another person, we can't, we can't think. I mean, we don't have an opinion. We're at that level anyway, so it's, it all comes down to where the person's heart. We can't judge that person, but yet the faith that uh, even the the priests and pastors of today, we see them saying things that are totally wrong. But here they, here, there they are with their large ministry. All these mm-hmm. to hell. So, are you saying that there's pastors that are going to hell? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Or the prostitutes and the uh, ex Because the one knows better. The sister should know better. He's got the scripture. He's born again. Well, you know, it's said one pastor said to another. You know, if I don't leave them and tell them what right, then God puts that on me because I am the one who gives the son of strength, I put them on the right path. And if I don't put them on the right path, then God's going to hold me responsible for that life. Do you think, knowing what we've just covered, that the enemy will do everything he possibly can to keep us out of the kingdom of God? Even if it looks like it's a uh, the religious thing to do, you think he's offering up a counterfeit way to get to God? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Actually, Jesus calls them blind guides. Blind. In fact, I was reading in John, and I can't bring it up right now, but in John, it actually says that God, the Father, had actually hardened their hearts and closed their eyes already. They couldn't see it. They couldn't see it. But yet Jesus spoke such harsh words to them, which is righteous judgment. When Jesus speaks that, that's righteous judgment already coming forth. So God was already had upon them the judgment, which means that they couldn't even hear the voice of God. They wouldn't recognize the voice of God. You know, John, it seems like that when you go like the parents and this whatever, you go through it, you think that God raised these people. He started from Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve fell from the sort of grace and was cast out of the garden of Eden. But the Jewish people have always lost their faith. So how did they get so far off the wrong track? It started back in the Old Testament, didn't it? God says, I'm your king. He says, no, we want a king just like the others have. So they started looking for this earthly rulership and got away from God right, right in the Old Testament. You could see that. And that has constantly gotten them in trouble as it gets all of us in trouble. 
So what's God's priority for our lives? Turn to Matthew 6, 31. You know these scriptures. We're talking about the kingdom. Matthew 6, 31 through 34. Jesus, Jesus tells his disciples, he did, he's not, look up at me for a second, he's not speaking to the masses. He's actually called his own disciples in, his inner circle, if you will, those who are sold out to him, who are not coming to him for what he can give them, who are not coming to him because of a religious experience. They already have a relationship with him. He calls them in. And he says to them, Take no thought, saying, What shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all, all, A-L-L, these things, material things if you will, do the Gentiles, and some of your Bibles may say pagans, seek. There's two things that are very important here. Jesus says, don't take the thought. In other words, the thought is going to come. The thought is going to come. And he's saying, when that thought comes, that goes against the kingdom principles, don't take it. Cast it down, we're told, those thoughts that come against God's word, correct? Don't take it. But then there's a second stage. This is when the rocket engines start to fire saying haven't you had thoughts that start bouncing around inside that skull of yours and all of a sudden they you start to give it life and you start to paint this visual picture and then you start to speak it what have you just done you've given it life you have given that thought that the enemy planted in our brain you have given it thought that thought power enough to create a picture And now you're starting to speak that picture. Genesis 1. God spoke. God spoke. God spoke. He had it in his mind. He spoke it. Are we not created in his image? Are we not dominion creatures? Are we not kingdom children? Do we not have the resources of heaven? Do we not have the angelic realm ministering for us? And all of a sudden, we take on a thought and we start to speak it. Jesus says, you are in the danger zone. You have just created something that's going against the kingdom. How can I possibly work in that realm? Jesus says, take no thought, saying, what shall we drink? How shall we be clothed? For after these things do the Gentiles or the pagans or those outside of the kingdom, if you will, Seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things, but you seek first, what? The kingdom of God. And His righteousness, the righteousness of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, take no thought for tomorrow, Anybody thinking about tomorrow, Monday, right? Anybody thinking about what might happen, what looms on the horizon? Maybe it's storm clouds in your life, something there. God's saying, don't even think about that. Take no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient is the day, is the evil thereof. Jesus says, you want to stay in my zone. You want to stay in the zone of blessing. You want to stay in the zone of of, of divine protection. Don't think about those things. Don't worry about those things. Don't stress. Now, I'm not negating things happen in our lives. I'm not saying we have to deal with things in our lives. But he says, don't get stressed out and worry about them. Because I got you covered. If... 
you seek the kingdom and my righteousness. If you don't and you're still a child of mine, I have no obligation to take care of you. It's either way. It's a conditional promise. It's a covenant agreement with conditions. So if you're going to enter into me and you must seek my kingdom, I'm going to take care of everything that you need. Watch this. Let me just go back here for a second. Getting close on time. That always happens. <laughs> In Matthew six twenty six, go back, just jump up a little bit to twenty six. Jesus says, Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away anything in the barns, and yet your heavenly Father takes care of them. Are you not much more valuable than they? We are created in God's image. We are His children. These are the things we have dominion over. He says, if God's taking care of... I'm not even... You don't have to go out and feed a robin this morning, right? God's taking care of that. That's all taken care of. He says, "If, if God takes care of them, aren't you more valuable than the robin? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single cubit to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See the lilies of the field. They do not labor nor spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? God's trying to make it real clear by his first kingdom principles. Don't you worry about any of those things. I will, by my word, promise to take care of you in all of those areas if you seek my kingdom first and my righteousness. You do that, it's my obligation. God says, my obligation to take care of all those things for you. Don't you dare worry about them. Don't you take thought and don't you start speaking them. I'm setting somebody free here this morning. Me. (laughs) You know what I mean? If we can start to grasp who we are in Christ and start to understand that I don't care what happens to America anymore. I don't care what happens to the price of gas anymore. I don't even care what happens to my bank account anymore. Because God may cause that to dwindle to the point where I go, I got nothing left but you. Yeah, that's all you had from the beginning. I just wanted to show it to you. You had nothing but me from the beginning when you thought you had something. He says, if you seek my kingdom and my righteousness, I must take care of everything, all the things that you need. And where do they come from? Does he drop gold dust down from heaven you could certainly do that but he actually brings them through this Babylonian system that's failing that's why we can walk through this and say recession that's too bad you guys are entering into that I refuse to enter into that what do you mean you refuse to enter into that I've got a different stimulus program I've got a different financial advisor I've got a different way of looking at life because I don't look from this system that's failing I look from the resources of the kingdom of heaven so if we are seeking the kingdom of God which is what you're doing right now and seeking his righteousness which I'm going to touch on just very quickly God says don't you worry about it don't you take a thought and start talking about it I'm going to add all these things to you I have a question but I don't want to fall out I don't want to speak it. Uh, it's like maybe I'm not believing. Um, why do the system works? I know God takes care of it. Sometimes you need to bring these things I never know of. But then I can worry about if the government is going to do this. Because I, I live on Social Security. I have to pay my rent and have to eat. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that decision. Think about that. 
No, it's not. It's not because you are a part of that system. You are in that system. But that social security check you get comes from God. It does not come from the U.S. government. It comes from God. That's a resource that God is putting in your hand. And if that one dries up, he's going to put another one in your hand. Whether it's through a brother or sister in his church or from the resources of the government, it doesn't matter. He's going to take care of you. He has to if you're seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. So what is a kingdom? What is a kingdom? Because we are come from this democratic mindset, this republic, where we have a vote and we have a say and we have an opinion, correct? Anybody uh, vote in the ele- last election? You don't have to raise your hands, but did you vote? I mean, you, because we want to be ruled and reigned by somebody who's better than the other person, correct? We want that person for governor, that person for senator, that person for president, because we don't want to be under that one. Watch this. Here's what a kingdom is. A kingdom is the governing influence of a king over his territory. Impacting it with his personal will, his purpose, his intent. Producing a culture, values, morals, and a lifestyle that reflects the king's desire and nature for his citizens. Doesn't it? God... I have so much to go through in in 90 seconds. The governing influence of a king over his territory. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is his territory. Earth he gave to man for dominion. It's the governing influence of a king over that territory, earth, impacting it with his personal will, his purpose, his intent, that is going to produce a culture, values, morals, and a lifestyle that reflects the king. You got that? When Jesus came, he said, the kingdom's back. The old way is gone. Behold, all things are new. What did he do? He walked around doing miracles, signs, and wonders and pointing right back to the kingdom. When he was crucified and he ascended, when he was resurrected, rather, and he came back, he spent 40 days with the disciples teaching them about the things of the kingdom. Turn to the book of Acts. And we'll close with this. Because I think... Actually, go to the book of Romans. Chapter 1. Go back one page to Acts. Acts chapter 28, the last verse. Paul, get this, look up at me for a second. Paul has been going on this marvelous journey where he's been persecuted and, and tortured and suffered things for the kingdom of God. And finally, he's going into his settling down stage. And what is the last thing we read about Paul? This is important because if you do this, this, I believe, is a key to us witnessing. We say, how, how, do, I, how do I bring Jesus to somebody? This is what Paul did. Read this. Go back to 30. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came to him. Preaching what? Jesus. Is that what it says? He's preaching the kingdom of God. And then what's he do? Then he teaches those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. We have it backwards, I submit to you. We preach Jesus and teach the kingdom. We should be preaching the kingdom and teaching Jesus. Think about the dynamics of that. When someone is hurting and someone is down, their marriage is falling apart, their finances are going into the pit, their health is failing. What do we say? You need Jesus. Say, no, I need a miracle. I need health. I need restoration. I need finances. Let me tell you about a kingdom. Let me tell you about a king. Let me tell you about the principles of a kingdom where the king says that he will supply all your needs if you do a couple of things. If you get in alignment with this king that I follow, 
He promises to take care of all of your needs. How He does that is up to Him. But in that, you are going to have peace. Do you have any peace now? How many people are in crisis that have no peace? Right? How many Christians can be in crisis and still have peace? Why? Because they know that the King has got them covered, however that looks. So Paul says, for two years, this is the last thing we see about Paul, he says, I am preaching the kingdom of God. Jesus says, the kingdom of Jesus is at hand. He said, no, the kingdom is at hand. He didn't say Jesus announcing. He said, the kingdom is at hand. This whole book is about a king, his kingdom, and his royal children. And the way into that kingdom is Jesus. Preach the kingdom and teach them about Jesus. Nowhere do you see religion. Nowhere do you see deeds and righteous acts in order to get into the kingdom. Teach them Preach the kingdom, 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 and then teach them about Jesus. Is that a little different than the way religion has taught us to do it? Anybody ever had, had a lot of resistance when we start to preach Jesus to somebody? Why? Because the flesh doesn't want that. The unregenerated flesh that's dark doesn't want that. Now, I'm not saying the Holy Spirit can't lead you into that and do marvelous things with the name of Jesus. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm just saying the Bible says, and Jesus shows us, it's all about the King and His kingdom. And the way in is Jesus. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank You for this morning. We thank You for this kingdom and the kingdom principles. We thank You for the light You're shedding on it. Father, you are our king. Jesus, you are the way into the kingdom. And Father, through your word, your heavenly provisions will come to us if we truly seek your kingdom and your righteousness. Father, let us with eyes open see religion and hold it back at bay and speak against it. The powers of darkness are trying to get to us. So, Father, in the marvelous name of Jesus, in the power and the authority of Jesus, I ask that no religious spirit enter this dwelling today. That no religious spirit can enter into worship. That we will walk in your truth and in your light and in your freedom, knowing that we are your children. That we are translated into your kingdom, as Colossians tells us. We thank you for the marvelous things you're doing. We pray in the marvelous name of our true King, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah.